I'd like to welcome my special guests up here, please. Felicia, Lisa, Raymond and Donna. <laughs> Raymond, sorry. Ray and Donna. So we're just going to um, gammon that we're sitting around, just having a chat. We're going to try and, you know, block out the audience so we can just get into the conversation, the flow of things. So if you want to take your shoes off like Lisa, you know, put your feet up, feel comfortable. In fact, I might just do that because... Um, So I, I think I'm just going to work through the questions and um, and, we'll work, and I, I'd just like you to, I'm not going to, maybe I'll focus on particular people for certain things, um, but generally, you know, just sort of um, conversational style, that'd be good. Yeah? All right. So first of all, um, I just want to, some background, or what, just tell me about, tell me about your story, tell me about you, and um, who would like to start? Or is it easier if I just pick, like, be the, put the school teacher hat on? What do you reckon? Just pick? Okay. Donna? <laughs> Can you just, yeah, tell us your story, Donna? Um, well, my story is, I feel a little bit funny being the, the early career um, researcher here. I, um, I sort of started as a librarian, that was my, my trade, and, and did various jobs, and then led into being an Aboriginal health worker in, um, in South Australia. So I worked in the southern suburbs of, of Adelaide and worked as a health worker for, for quite a few years and, and did a certificate in primary health care. And then I had the, the wonderful opportunity to uh, work with a, a project in the southern suburbs of Adelaide around maternal, Aboriginal maternal and infant care. That was when I was um, became interested in, in research. Of course, being the project officer for that, I had the wonderful joy of working alongside and, and meeting Kim O'Donnell Charmaine Power and Anne Nixon, they were doing the evaluation of that project and I think um, it was very fortunate because you did something very different than having me very involved in the evaluation. I don't think project officers office really get much of a chance to do that. So that was my first taste of, um, of research and understanding um, how important evaluations are of course in regards to funding and, and having that evidence for um, a small population group of Adelaide around maternal and infant care. So from, from there, I, the other um, organisation that was a, a huge help to me was the Aboriginal Health Council of South Australia, who provided the, the um, primary health care certificate and then actually developed the Indigenous Research Capacity Building Certificate for, at a Certificate 4 level. So that was um, my level, or my entry into research, so a bit um, different to the, the more academic um, setting, I guess. So, so that's a little bit about how I got into it and, and have really, I guess, been able to look at it from a different side, not from the, the academic view. So being a non-academic and very grounded in community, I think I sort of was able to um, bring different perspectives that maybe some of um, some academics that had different entries into research and, and particularly Aboriginal research. So I was, um, I still am still a, a non-academic researcher, which I, I enjoy, but being the early career research researcher, I think there's always a bit of pressure to, to move on into different areas, but I'm happy where I'm at. At the moment. At the moment, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? Um, mine's, um, well, it's interesting to me, but um, I, uh, I was one of those people that uh, went straight from high school to university um, and I did nursing uh, at university so that was my first degree and that was just at the time when nursing had moved from the hospital setting to university so I got to experience all the trauma within nursing that that created as well so there's a bit of a divide between hospital trained nurses and university trained nurses. Um, uh, after I finished nursing, I um, actually went and worked as an Aboriginal health worker. Uh, so I kind of went the other way around. Usually people go and work as Aboriginal health workers, then sort of transition into nursing or medicine or other areas like that. Um, and as an Aboriginal health worker in northern New South Wales, that's where I got my first experience of research. 
Um, there was a big project we were running up around Moree, Gunnada, Tamworth in that area uh, around diabetes and uh, I ran a survey and some data collection um, up there and um, so that was my first experience of research and I really liked it, um, especially survey design and data collection. So um, after that I did some other things and uh, ended up in Canberra where I'm now uh, doing a master's degree in epidemiology and um, that's really where my research uh, interest, I guess, blossomed um, because in a period of two years it was an applied degree. Um, in a period of two years we did six research projects so they were quite short but very intense. Um, and after that I went and worked in community control health service and uh, uh, one of my tasks in that role was heading up a research unit within the community control sector so um, of course I enjoyed that a lot and um, when I left uh, that role it was to pursue my PhD so um, yeah researchers I never thought I'd end up there I didn't have that intention I was always interested in uh, you know, I guess clinical sort of treatment approaches and that sort of thing, but it's progressed much further now to, um, you know, asking questions about how we treat people in services and if we treat them a certain way or this way or that way, does that improve outcomes for people? So I'm very interested in applied research and feeding that back into the service level. I don't know if I've landed there yet, frankly. Um, I, I didn't, I, I left home really young. I, I left school at 14, I was a runaway. And um, uh, after some period of time, I ended up um, doing hospital-based training as a nurse and became a nurse. And thinking back, you know, did I do any research then? Well, you know, it's a very hands-on field, you know, I love nursing. It was really great for someone like me, it's not real bright, you know, but very good at doing stuff and learning from what I see others doing and uh, and applying that whole idea around, well, how do I want to be treated right, in hospital, especially when I'm a bit crook or something, right? Um, but in about 1979, which seems like a long time ago, um, there were some outbreaks of infections and someone started putting together some ideas around hand washing for doctors, which was really, really contentious. Okay. And, uh, and that was the first time I ever did anything researchy. Anyhow, years passed, I ended up in medical school. I ended up dropping out of medical school and ended up doing a Master of Public Health. And that's when I started to uh, see what research was and understand uh, the innards of it. It's, it's a quite a big beast, you know, and there's a million different branches of it and there's a hundred thousand different things that you can do on any given day. And, uh, and my real research began when I also did um, epidemiology training with New South Wales Health and uh, ended up getting a job at at South East Sydney Area Health Service as the public health epidemiologist where we had to do lots and lots of mini research projects on outbreaks. So it was all about trying to find out, you know, what caused these people to get crook or, you know, what, what the risks are and then applying, it's very much applied um, process. Um, I've now become, I suppose I'm sort of entering into being a real researcher or a big girl or whatever in a large university and I'm, I'm involved in some very large research projects and, you know, the thing that I've taken away from all of this when I talk to other researchers is that uh, I didn't know what a researcher was when I was growing up as a kid, I had no idea what that looked like and I sort of run around with a little flag of if I can do it, anyone can do it because you know you don't have to go through a traditional mechanism to become a researcher, you just have to ask the right questions and be fairly diligent about it, follow protocols that are, you know, people know you can ask, there's lots of people around to ask and do the very best you can. Um, well, my family's from the Torres Strait, so um, although I was born and raised in Cairns, so most of my research involves Torres Strait Islanders and has a particular focus on Torres Strait Islanders, particularly those in the other on the mainland. But my, I, I similarly started out like Donna doing um, non-academic research, if you like. I was a career public servant before heading into the uni sector and um, 
Uh, my passion for research comes from finding out answers to things that we don't know. And I really enjoyed um, working with other public servants when we were looking at issues around, um, in particular, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women's career development, and we ran focus groups, and I, I loved all of that. And that um, all, as I said, didn't have an, an academic context, but I, I, I guess it sparked in with me that, that um, I might have my own ideas about the reasons for um, Aboriginal and women's career development, but there was something about working on the ground with women and asking them, what do you think? How, how can we change policies in the sector to assist you? And I just love that. And I could see the, the real link between asking people and then generally following that through into some sort of change. And I thought then, I, I really like this. I, I, I think I can do this, I like this, and um, I, I like the results it can bring. I suppose I probably need to share my story as well for some people who don't know how I got into research in a really, really roundabout way. Um, I, I guess, I guess you know, I was thinking about a public health kind of researcher being in this space. It really um, started for me as a kid when I was about 10 years old, um, the thinking and, the, and probably being around... Um, uh, in the 70s, being in Sydney with my mum as one of the um, health workers for Redfern Medical Service. Um, at that time, I didn't realise how significant that, that time was. I didn't really understand it. But in hindsight now, I think, well, you know, that was probably the beginning of my interest in working um, in, in Indigenous health and, and education. Mainly because I'm absorbed in it. That's my life. That's how I experience this. But... Um, uh, that's probably where it started for me. Um, I actually graduated as a school teacher, um, primary school teacher, in the 80s. Um, probably around, I think my first teaching post, no I don't think, my first teaching post was uh, a place called Peppermanati in Northern Territory, where I spent three years with the Nangikurungu people. And um, I had the most amazing um, and um, uh, it was one of the most amazing times of my life. And of course, my family, my aunts were going, were saying, where's she going now? Where's she going? And I'm going, I'm going up to Northern Territory, a place called Peppermanati, and I'm gonna just work there for 12 months and come home again. And when I stayed for three years, um, then the aunties were saying, well, come on, you know, it's time to come back this way. Um, so I started off with the teaching and I, and I kind, of, kind of went across to health because of what I saw at Pepe with the trachoma programs and with the way people were flying in and out and there was this disjoint or there, there was this big gap between education and health. And I couldn't kind of get my head around that because I thought, well, health and education, it has to go hand in hand, you can't have one without the other. So I kind of shifted across to health and went back to uni in about 2002. Um, I did some other stuff on the way, and it was my son that actually helped me um, with the IT stuff because when I was going through uni, it was all handwritten assignments, and you had to just keep writing and writing, and not the, not the techn technological uh, uh, stuff we've got today to make it easy. I don't know. Sometimes I don't think it makes it easy. Sometimes it makes it a little bit hard too. For sometimes we maybe spend too much emphasis on the technologies and not enough on the interactive or the social face-to-face -face stuff. And the good old drawing with the butcher's paper, I think, um, as um, Jane Fremantle said this morning. So um, so that's how I got into um, research and that's, and I came, I was, I moved from Northern Territory in 2000, year 2000 and um, I've been 12 years in Adelaide now and the reason why I moved was to be closer to my family and to kind of come back to country um, and give give back and learn and walk my country next year when I've finished this thesis, which is really, really important. So um, so that's that's me um, in a nutshell. Um, I guess what I'd like to um, now uh, talk about is, um, first of all, what, what, what are the challenges um, what has been the challenges or what still remain the challenges for um, my guests um, on, on, in terms of their journey and, and, and the spaces and places where you work. What, what, what are some of the challenges that, um, that have been there 
for you or still may be there. And kind of how, how have you gotten around over, under, between the barriers or, or, or some of those challenges? Um, so if we could maybe start with Ray. <laughs> and, and I said, I remember asking Ray, Ray this question yesterday, and, and he, he was joking around with me and said, what challenges? I didn't have any. <laughs> and I looked at him, oh, true, bud. But it's true. And he had this real serious face, and I thought, well, you must have bloody studied in a bubble. So, yeah, so, anyway. I try to study in a bubble, <laughs> um, but it's just not reality. Um, I guess... Um, in my journey to becoming a researcher, probably the, um, the biggest challenge for me, and this is very personal, is um, self-doubt. Um, and I don't think people talk about it as much as they probably should. Um, and it's, um, it interferes a lot in my research um, and what I do in terms of getting my thesis finished. But also, you're always questioning yourself, am I, you know, the first, first thing you do in research is uh, you need to ask a question. And so you spend a lot of time thinking, am I asking the right questions? Uh, or how do I ask the right question? So there's a lot, for me, there's a lot of doubt around, uh, am I asking the right question? But also, um, the biggest challenge is when I ask that question and I've collected my data and um, I'm trying to analyse or interpret that, um, is am I doing the right thing with this? Um, and so that's, that's a question for me that continually rolls around in my head because, um, I mean, the research that I do mostly is in a very sensitive area, it's around alcohol, alcohol use in the community. Um, and so there's a potential, depending on how the data is analysed and explained. This is all the stuff Jane was talking about this yeah. morning. Yeah. So, you know, there's a potential for different stakeholders um, to take what you've done and uh, interpret it a different way or in a way that's not very nice. So you become very protective of who sees that stuff which is not great in research because research is meant to be disseminated to help inform policy and decisions. So, um, but also, there's also doubt around um, your own ability. Um, I think it's how I grew up. We, we, I, um, I know Lisa on the video and, um, and a couple of other people talk about how education was... Uh, you know, it was much uh, it was emphasised in their families, but in my family it was actually the opposite. Um, it was almost, I feel that it was um, in some ways discouraged. Um, because what you did when you learnt something was you challenged, um, you were then able to challenge someone's thinking, um, and particularly a parent or a sibling, um, about what the conversation uh, or the way the conversation was going. So I, I felt um, that education wasn't a focus in my family. And I come from a large family, there's seven children. Um, and so I, yeah, I just had this feeling that um, uh, education wasn't a focus in my family. And I'm still the only child out of that seven that finished high school and went to university. And I still get grief about it sometimes from other family members. So I tend not to talk about what I do or that sort of stuff, which, you know, it's, it's not great, but at the same time I sort of understand, you know, the old tall poppy syndrome sort of lives a bit in my family. So that's a huge challenge in uh, my career as well. Um, yeah, so they're the biggest things for me, quite personal. That, that's to follow up thing. on that? Yeah, that's a, that's a big thing, isn't it? Like feeling alone. Um, yeah. It's the same in my family. I'm still the only person that have gone to university in, in my family. And it's, there's a lot of stuff I can't talk about. You know, it's just like, you know, it's just not there. But, you know, there's plenty of other good things to talk about too. So. 
Um, the big issue I find is this whole construction of silos. You know, being a health researcher, you get plonked in this thing, and so therefore, these are the things that you should be doing. And my colleagues that are education researchers do all this stuff and get plonked in their silo, and environmental scientists get plonked in theirs, and you know, so we've got all these silos around the joint. And we know that Aboriginal health will improve mainly through things that are not directly health related. Right? You know, so that's education, that's housing, that's water, that's sovereignty, that's land, that's you know, like all this other stuff, which is not traditional health. And so the biggest issue I've had is when I've been going for, for grants and when I've been going for building teams and when I participate in broader teams, there's often quite a lot of criticism around who's on the team and why and how does that contribute directly to this thing called Aboriginal health. And I think it's very, very frustrating. We know uh, in our heart of hearts what we need to do to make things happen. And we know that the knowledge, actually I think a lot of the data is there, right? And a lot of the knowledge is there, but it's how we synthesise that. And, you know, someone was talking yesterday about secondary analysis of information. A lot of us just don't have the time and the space to do it because you're your back's against the wall again for the next research funding. You know, so you've got all of that stuff going on. So the biggest issue that I have is, is how it is we can uh, put some pipes in those silos and join them up all together with a view of actually removing the silos altogether and looking at a whole of life approach and starting to enact the, the NAS uh, process and the whole thing around what is health. You know, it's not only the absence of disease, but it's how an individual stands in wellness and love and respect and spiritual and emotional strength themselves, their family, the community and broader society. You know, that's the land, that's the sea, that's the air, that's the works. You know, so I just see that as being the biggest challenge and I think if we can do anything about it, you know, health is a really good indicator or measure of success, but it is not the story in research, I believe. Alicia? I just wanted to follow up on Lisa's yeah. point because yeah. the project that I'm working with is termed an environmental science um, project because it's dealing with traditional hunting and sustainable fisheries. But yeah, I, I saw it very differently because from where I stood, it was also about health, well-being, people's diet, um, their sense of identity, their connection to the Torres Strait. So it's interesting that you say that. I think that's a very real issue, um, Lisa. Um, my challenge, um, if I could frame it in these terms, is working with your own mob is the most rewarding and yet the most challenging thing that you can do. And I say it's rewarding, I think, for the obvious reasons, because you're making a direct contribution, you're working with your mob, you're learning um, at the same time. But um, the particular project I'm working on, which is looking at the sharing of turtle and dugong between communities in the, on the mainland and up in the Torres Strait. Um, before we were about to start our project, literally about a month before we were about to go on the road and talk to people about it, um, there was two articles on um, ABC which depicted Torres Strait Islanders very negatively. I'm not sure if people saw it here, but literally showed um, you know, what we call rogue hunters, young lads who went out flipping a turtle on the back and doing yeah, things that um, stuff again, so. yeah, yeah, and the interesting thing was is that from the Islanders' perspective, the people who actually got that sensational footage actually posed as researchers, and they called themselves researchers. So we were going out in this environment where people were very angry, um, very confused about what was happening, um, and then in the middle of what we were doing, the state government decided that they were going to um, pass the bill and they actually introduced us legislation against animal cruelty. So that was all in this, this mix of this story. Um, so I found going out um, and working with my mob in that environment was extremely challenging because you hold yourself to a higher standard um, of accountability. And, but your, your mob holds you to a higher standard too because you're trying to bridge that gap between you know, the university and the funding body and then also with them. And um, I'm the only um, Indigenous and Torres Strait Islander person on the research team. So always um, you know, making sure that you, you're so responsible for the whole team's conduct because unlike um, 
the other researchers, if this whole thing goes belly up, well, I might as well move overseas, I tell them, because <laughs> there's not many places in Australia could go where people aren't going. No, they, so you, it's a lifelong attachment, so that's why I say it's, it's the most rewarding thing, but it's also comes with its own challenges. And most of that you put on yourself. I know I do, most of that I put on myself. Um, but, yeah, that's, that's what I see as something that I, I, I'm working through. It's a work in progress. I think I have all the answers yet. Yeah. I'm glad you brought that up, um, Felicia, because I remember um, my mum saying to me um, years ago, she said, oh, babe, you know what? She said, the hardest thing is working for our own people because you, you're pulled from pillow to post and you, 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 uh, if you don't look after yourself or you don't you know, have those networks or those little groups of friends and, and uh, family and colleagues, work colleagues that kind of get it where you don't have to waste your energy explaining and, you know, what it's what it's like about working in this space. She said, you know, it, it is the hardest thing working for our own, for our people because we are, as Felicia said, we, you know, we, we are held to uh, account and um, I don't think um, researchers in other, from other um, backgrounds or cultures um, really fully understand that, except for the researchers that have built the relationships with um, people uh, in the small pockets right around the country, except for the researchers that have, have, um, have already established relationships um, that, that kind of get it, but that, that's taken time. So, um, and, I, and I have to tell you now, my mum works for um, an NGO called Interrelate. She's just got her... Um, uh, full-time, kind of, she's semi, semi-retired, but she's just got a full-time position at the age of 65. And she was so excited. And uh, she says, oh, babe, I just love working with this mob because they actually value what I bring. They actually um, understand and they, they, they follow up on my advice. So um, I, I was blessed when I felt really, really excited for my mum when, when she was able to say that. So... So mums work for um, Indigenous organisations as, as well as um, non-Indigenous organisations and so she's, she's, she's probably been a huge um, inspiration with some of the advice that um, she's given me because it is, it is difficult and it's, a, it's quite a balancing act, isn't it? You know, it's a real juggling act. Um, so thanks for, for sharing that with us. I'm not as good as professional as Oprah, um, so I'm hopeful. Um, so I'll just keep working through these questions here. Um, Donna. I, yeah. Sorry, oh, Donna. I mean, that's all right. Because I, I see Donna all the time. No, 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 don't, okay. be, don't be quick because it'll stop me from talking. Just <laughs> thinking about, about challenges, I, I, I think on two different levels, personal, personally and, and professionally, and, and much like the, the panel here too, you know, I've come from a background that didn't really encourage a lot of... Um, the, additional education, you know, after after high school and coming from a family of six being you know, the first one to only first and only to finish year twelve and then to get other, you know, certificates. But on the personal level I, th I think a lot of us probably experience the, the connection that we have, might have to whatever research that we're doing and being around um, maternal infant care, I'm not a mother myself, but I'm a very proud, generous, kind and loving auntie. But I when I first started working um, with the maternal and infant care, my younger sister was pregnant and she was quite young. So that what I think a lot of people you know, don't really know is how, how we carry that connectedness to the, to the work that we're doing and take a personal responsibility to either providing services or improving services you know, for family members. And I also think for me on the professional level, of course, not having a degree or um, any of those further academic papers to, to prove myself, it is about having a confidence in my skills and experience in whatever I bring to a position which sometimes really conflicts with what um, academics are actually sort of looking for. So that that's a, a, a continual struggle, I think. It doesn't change if you it get doesn't, paper. <laughs> that's right. Even if you haven't got the papers. <laughs> All right, then I'll keep that in mind. But I think, you know, those are the, those are the things that really stand out for me and, and how, um, I think, how us as Aboriginal people actually sometimes have a working role, but it's also a healing role that is quite personal for us in our communities. So those are, those are the challenges and, and, the, and, you know, and then the barriers that, that come across for women who do want to improve things, whether it be because of our sister's experience, auntie's experience, or our family and community experiences. We've got those personal connections. Thank you. Thank 
you, Donna. I apologise for missing out on your sister girl. Um, I, I'd want to probably, um, I'd like to ask Lisa um, about that gorgeous little pin on your um, collar there. If you could you um, maybe just explain that, if, only if you feel comfortable about it, and yeah. maybe the kind of dilemma that kind of you maybe were in, um, in with that. And if you don't feel comfortable, then that's okay. Just no, no, say, no, no, no. I yeah. don't feel comfortable. Yeah, no, it's okay. It's um, it's I I got a letter um, a year or so ago about it um, in about March last year, and it was from Government House in in Canberra, and it said that I've been nominated. Um, for the work that I've been doing at the University of New South Wales around medical education. And, um, you know, I work in a team. It's a really solid, strong team. But someone thought that... Um, I always thought we just annoyed the faculty all the time, <laughs> trying to get things improved. And we annoyed the faculty by, you know, working through processes to engage Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities so they trusted us to send their kids to uni and become doctors and you know, grow into researchers and do masters of public health degrees and the rest of anything else. Someone took notice of that and wrote off. And I was asked if I would be willing to accept an Order of Australia award. And, um, and uh, once I dried the tears, I, I started talking to people about this, because this is a really big thing, because a lot of our mob get asked about this, and there's a great deal of reticence for people to take on these things, because it's, it's you know, I mean, one of, one of my cousins said, oh, bloody colonial, uh, the invaders. Uh, so, um, But then I thought, what else could it do? So I spoke to some people that I knew that had these awards, and I said, what's the big thing that happened to you as a result of this? And one woman who I trust a lot, who helped, who helped build a scholarship program with me, said, it allows you to go into places that you never dreamt of going to to have very important conversations. And I thought, okay, that'll do. Okay, so I wrote back and said, yeah, I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and so the citation was about medical education and also for providing opportunities for Aboriginal people and scholarships at the uni. And so when I, I got my award, um, you know, they send all these rules out about what you need to do with how you wear it and stuff, so you wear it when you wear a jacket, right? Um, but I've had conversations on planes with people that have said, oh, what did you get that for? And like, a lot of people know what the thing's about, you know, what did you get for? And I'm able to say, oh, it's for, you know, and it allows a conversation to occur. And honestly, strangers in the street will come up and, and ask you about that. Or the lady in DJs will ask, you know, David Jones will ask you. And, yeah, I, I feel really privileged. The, the problem with the system, though, is that it's a team thing, you know, it's not Lisa doing this on her own, it's Lisa and a whole mob of people who are doing it together. Um, and, you know, that that's probably the greatest discomfort. I, I don't feel colonised because I've accepted this. I feel as though it's a, a door that allows a conversation to occur, to invite people to participate in some of our worldviews. Um, but it's, it, I actually think there needs to be a, another way of recognising the role of our local communities in making this type of thing happen for people. So. Do you think that would require um, systemic uh, or, or structural infrastructural changes? Yeah, I think so. Because you did mention before the silos, you know, yeah. whether it's at universities or whether it's in education or whether it's, you know, at the different layers um, of, of, our, of our society. Yeah, I think that the key with this stuff is that the, these particular levels of awards are not for doing your job well, right? So it's it's not because you're really good as an academic or a researcher or an educator or whatever it is that you do, because um, that's what you get paid to do. Right? But it's about going over and beyond that, and the team that have put this together go over and beyond that. And there's not an Aboriginal person I know that works in the system that doesn't go over and beyond. And, you know, like you, you know, you can't uplift yourself out of community when you know the bells go off at five o'clock and you can go home. You know, you're always there, you're always taking responsibility, you're always being questioned about stuff you did 20 years ago. Um, you know, and I know it's going to be like that forever. You know, you're going to be condemned to life for what it is you do today. And um, you know, I, I just think we do always go over and beyond. It, it's part of how we do and what we do. If we're in this particular game, um, you know, and it's so important and everyone you know like 
You can count on your hands every day the lives that are affected because of what you do. And I think that's a really big gig and I think most of us take that responsibility really seriously. So it's, it's, it's something that recognises that in a, a different kind of way and I think we need to work out a system of expanding that. Do, do my other guests have any questions for Lisa um, in this area? Or do you have any questions for each other? There might be something that's you know, come up in your, in your head or that you'd like to ask. No? Okay. Um, I'll just go through my questions here and see if there's anything... You can't... You, you, we, we touched on um, the, the word, or the concept of trust. Um, I maybe Conrad would probably like to maybe um, for each of my strong and deadly guests to um, maybe um, tell me, how, how could that be, um, how's, how's trust developed in the, in the relationship, you know, from a practical perspective? Like if someone was coming in to, to work in um, Indigenous health, um, what, what would be sort of the advice you'd give them about um, how, how to work in a, in a practical way around trust? Because, you know, we hear, we hear the soft and fuzzy words, which I, I think for us um, in government language are soft and fuzzy words like trust and, um, and hope and um, um, strong um, kind of is, uh, is far and few between. And I, I kind of sort of think that, um, uh, you, that, that the language uh, in this area is very important. You know, you kind of, you feel torn. I, I think that, you know, they call it binary language. Um, and even if you look at the political system, how, and the, particularly the media, and I think um, Felicia mentioned the media before and how damaging that is um, for, for building relationships, particularly with um, our people. Um, what, what would be your advice around um, building relationships with, with our people? Donna? I am um, currently in a, in a position where I'm actually working on an interstate relationship. So I'm employed by the Murdoch Children's Research Institute who um, are running a statewide project in South Australia. So, I, um, so my boss works here in, in Melbourne and I, I work in, in South Australia with six other Aboriginal um, research interviewers. So uh, that's... Trust is such an important word in that when, you, when you're not having daily contact with someone who's actually managing a research project. But when, you know, developing trust, I think, especially with, with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, I, I think we're so very open and, and a lot of it is about connecting to people. You know, like we, we come into work and you're talking about um, your family and everything else and, and it's about sort of breaking down barriers and, and not taking everything so seriously and sharing parts of yourself. That's what I've found have, have really succeeded in, in, having, in creating relationships with, you know, Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people and then in my sake actually keeping it open interstate as well. So that's, I mean, it is, it's a wonderful thing I think to be able to, to know and believe that it's something that's going to be ongoing and you, and you hope that by sharing parts of yourself, with, you know, professionally or, or personally, I think um, that's a good starting point, I think. It, it is, and I think as Lisa said before, you know, when you when people understand what that is and they understand your story, um, it is. It starts conversations. The only the, the thing I find um, is um, sometimes with with my with um, um, my non-indigenous or my, my non-indigenous colleagues, not all of them, but sometimes with 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 them, I find um, there's this kind of like a barrier up to um, between me and. And, and them, um, and it's around, you know, when, when we meet each other, the first thing um, we do uh, is say, oh, you know, how, how are you, and where, where, you, where you come from, where you from, and um, oh, you're from, uh, you know, Pepper Minardi, or you're from, oh, yeah, it, it, is, it actually starts a conversation, and, and it's a way of connecting. Now, I don't think that is, that's, that's, I don't think that's just an Aboriginal thing, that's a human, human thing. Um, and I, I, I think, and I had this conversation with with my friend I grew up with, went to school together, and 
she said, she said, you know, I find when I say I'm just from Sydney, when I say oh, I'm from Sydney, the conversation stops. But if I say if I'm if I if I say I'm from Summer Hill suburb in a in in a Sydney, well, it, it generates oh, it's you know it, it's it enables the, the conversation to to flow. And I think there's this pressure on choosing when I talk about binary language. You know, um, we can talk about you know black and white. We can talk about the individualistic um, approach to the collective approach. We can talk about these complete binaries, but no one is. There's not the language to talk about all that stuff in between, I think, we're, which is where we all sit. We want to um, engage and we want to do all this stuff. And, it, you know, it, it puts pressure on, on us to choose one or the other. And I think um, Ray mentioned um, it puts pressure uh, within our families to choose one or the other. But, you know, that's not our problem. That's that's not that's not our problem to carry. Um, so I, I was I guess I'd probably like to put it out there to um, that's a non-indigenous person in the crowd. And you know, if you're offended by me saying non-indigenous, don't don't be offended. Um, I, I'd like to just put it out there. I ask a question, I guess, from some a non-indigenous person out there about what we've just talked about. You know. You may be the first to be educated, educated, you know, university educated. We get education a lot of different ways, but you may be the first in your family, and has that created tension? Has that created, you know, kind of the tall poppy stuff? Because it's everywhere, really, you know. So, would anyone like to um... come on? Don't be shy, be going. Oh, lovely. I'll just can I just pass the mic? Yeah, I, um, my name's Julie, and uh, I was the first person to go to university in my family, and I went to university because of the changes that Whitlam made yeah. to, um, he got rid of fees. And so I, um, I went to Griffith Uni in Brisbane, and, um, but my family had no idea of, of how to support me. Uh, I think they gave me $25 a week, and I lived away from home that was supposed to pay for rent and food and transport and, <laughs> and everything else, but... Um, so, but I did environmental science but to begin with, and I didn't do very well at university because of that. Um, but uh, to begin with, but I, I now I'm doing postgraduate studies, so there's a journey for everybody. But I remember my um, brother saying to me when I did teaching, first I did, went to uni and I did nursing, and I finished off my degree while I was nursing, um, and then I did post, uh, postgraduate diploma of teaching, and I remember he said, oh, those who can do and those who can't teach. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's sort of like that, oh, you think you're, you're good, but you're not. <laughs> um, but I was just going to say that I think a lot of this binary, or you're educated or you're not, is this whole idea of what learning is about and where you learn. And I remember um, I did environmental studies and a lot of the stuff that I did with that, at times I couldn't connect with, I just felt like the environment was being put into a box and you were studying it, and you were doing these transects, and you're, you're, it was very, um, you, you put a, a measure out, and you measured how many organisms were in that square metre, and all this sort of thing, and I didn't enjoy it at all. Uh, but when I left university, I, I remember I just, I mean, I loved the bush. I grew up in mangroves in Brisbane on Moreton Bay and all that sort of stuff, but I just loved learning about trees and plants, and I taught myself about it by reading, and I think... This is what we forget, is that people teach themselves or they learn through other people because they have an interest, they have a passion for what they want to do. And learning is going on all around us all the time. Um, and I think if we appreciate the learning in our families, then it helps break down those barriers between us. Um, my father was a, boy, I was a fitter and turner and he, you know, he was really like a self-taught engineer. And he built everything himself, he built our house, he did all the work on all our cars at home, you know, all that sort of stuff. Um, so, you know, learning is everywhere and people learn as they go. Thank you so much for sharing your story with us. I, I guess the reason why I ask is that, you know, we, 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 have, we have more in common um, as, 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 um, as, as, as individuals from the family of human beings, really, because we, you know, we're all from the one um, human, one 
species, one human family, but we, we might just sort of um, approach a, a, a problem or come up with different strategies to solve that problem in different ways. And it's not to say that the different way, you know, there's one way that's better than another. I think that depends on the context in which you work. And, and as Lisa said, the importance of teamwork um, is, is really important in that when, um, when, when you achieve something, it's not just you. It, you wouldn't have been able to do it without your team um, and that support. So, um, so that's, that's, that's really important. Um, how are we going for time there, Rowan? 20 minutes. 20 minutes. Okay. Um, now, let's see. Um, what else have we got? Are there any questions that, that my guests could maybe um, prompt me on? Is there anything? I think I've um, covered them. Are you comfortable with if I just put the mic out to the audience? Absolutely. Then it stops me from rubbing. Can I get to have a drink of water? Don't you want to say <laughs> already? Oh, Di, I, Di's got a question. She's the one that did the hopeful Winfrey thing here. I just wanted to ask you all, um, within the university system, what sort of support you got, whether it's the right support, or what can be improved to uh, get people to stay. Lisa, do you want to yeah, start off with that? What, what can we do to improve the support for? Oh, God. Well, when I started at university, um, you know, there was very few Aboriginal people there. We had a Koori Centre on, on my campus, um, but that was focused towards a lot of other different... There was no one really supporting the medicine group, and our support was at another campus halfway across the city. Um, and I found my first three years at university to be diabolically lonely. Um, I was a mature age student with family responsibilities, and I was working hard to pay the rent, um, but at the same time I was failing everything. Because there was the expectation, right, that, you know, you've gotten into university, therefore you know, you know, you're numerate and literate and able to study and you know what you need to do and how to, you know, like, and I had absolutely no idea, you know. I was just <laughs> and I always thought as I was moving out of medicine into public health, and I call that a transition time, that if there was ever any Aboriginal students that I could ever help get through medicine, that it would be my life's work to make sure that happened. You know, that was, you know, then. When I got a job at UNSW, though, um, there were some fantastic supports on campus, so 10 years had changed a lot, right? And so obviously the system had learned quite a lot about what Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people need. When they move away from home, they go into these weird environments called the university. There aren't the conversations usually at the dinner table. Um, more often than not, they're the first person in their whole families to go to uni. So there's all of these things that are same, same. That being said, I still don't know if we've got it right. You know, I think there is a long, long way to go. Um, for the first time this year, our university has now got parity in our medical school with the population of Aboriginal people in the community. So we've got over 2% of our cohort is now Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students, which is really great. It's taken 10 years of hard work to get there. And I still don't think what we do for them is good enough because the kids that are doing medicine now probably would have gone to university anyhow. We're still not getting... Um, those people who have got profound educational disadvantage and other disadvantages in the door yet. And I think the programs that we have to run have to advantage those students. Now, we've got a bunch of graduate students in at the moment as well who are all Aboriginal health workers from you know, various AMSs, and they are running rings around the academy with their experience. Right? They know more than, you know, um, and their experience is absolutely priceless. But when it comes to the academic stuff, that's where the supports are needed. And it's very, very hard to, to fast track people in that academic learning environment with what we have available. So there's a lot more that we do need to, to, to have happen. And that has to happen both locally when they go back to work on, on Monday at the AMS, as well as in the academy when we pull them out of work knowing they've got all this other stuff going on in their minds and they can only spend a few hours with us. 
So I don't, I don't think we're there yet. I think we're a long way away. Um, I think we have to start looking at better modes of, of teaching and learning and education and, and recognising that exit strategies out of university don't always have to be with degrees, but they can be with other proper valid qualifications. The recognition of things like track record. I think someone who's worked as an Aboriginal health worker for 20 years has got a track record that's much, much greater than anything that we could give the university, frankly. So I just think we need to have so a So we need to maybe, in, within the um, academic setting, is to value that. Put it, put it in there. Well, we need we're not just value it. We need to privilege it. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Felicia. Oh, I'll um, take a, uh, another tack talking about the um, indigenous researchers in the university system. So the pe people who are the teachers, the academics, and I just like to acknowledge Professor Yvonne Cadet James, who's one of my colleagues, who's at the back there. Yeah. Because um, we I hope you don't mind me saying Yvonne, but we recently submitted to an internal review of the university uh, about the, the lack of support for Indigenous researchers in the university because they're often loaded up with teaching and a whole range of other responsibilities that they have with their communities and work that they do with students, all that personal stuff that you were talking about, um, Donna. So we were saying that institutionally the university needs to do more and review workloads and a whole range of things, support people to get their degrees. Because the bind that we have with Indigenous researchers in the universities is they've often got their undergrad degrees, but they're struggling to get their masters and PhDs and, and work at the same time. So until you do that, you're limiting your ability to take on either a CI role, a chief investigator role, or, or a principal investigator role in those big projects. So we've got this real double bind. The university says, yes, we want Indigenous researchers to be heading up these projects, but um, we still have to keep putting non-Indigenous professors and other suitably qualified people in those roles. So we, we've raised that issue with the university, and hopefully you know, it's a long-term issue, but it needs to be addressed for sure. Thank you. Ray? Um, I'd probably echo the um, same thing. I, I remember as a, an 18, 17, 18 year old going straight from school into university as an undergrad, I actually had quite good support. Um, there was a, there was a, uh, a Koori Centre at the university that I was at and a whole bunch of us seemed to start at the same time. We were in all different areas of study. but. We, we all ended up living with each other in share houses and that sort of stuff. So it was a great environment and it was very supporting. Um, probably also killed a few brain cells as well, but, um, <laughs> um, over that three years. But um, So my undergrad experience was quite positive and very supportive. And I think that was right at that transition that Lisa was talking about in terms of supports for undergraduate, young undergraduate people where the typical, you know, so it was a typical uh, progression for, you know, that was the same for most students. You come straight from school, straight to university, and so that, you know, that was typical. Where it's very different now um, is the post, post grad land, and, and where um, I can see there's a transition for me now between postgraduate study and being an academic, even though I detest that. Um, so, um, uh, it's, I find I'm quite isolated um, in terms of the university where I'm at because I'm the only, well, when I graduate, I'll be the only uh, Indigenous graduate from that whole school ever uh, with a PhD. So, um, so, that's kind of a new thing for them, but at the same time, the reason why I'm studying at that particular school is that my master's uh, supervisors are in that school. So the trust issue comes in um, a bit there because I know these people and I've had experience with them before and they're good. Um, but um, I also know at the university that they're, they're creating these positions around Indigenous health uh, at the university, but at the same time, you can't you sort of watch, you sit back and see uh, with the university about what they're going, what they're doing, and what they're trying, and to me they're just not trying with that sort of stuff. So, whereas at Aatsis, where I'm at now, they actually support me financially, and um, I guess with colleagues as well. Um, so it's, it's a much better space at Aatsis 
sitting there where you feel supported and it decreases the level of doubt. Uh, whereas at the university it increases the level of doubt, am I worthy to be in this space? Uh, even though they're saying they've got a commitment to this, you kind of think, well, do you really? Um, so, you know, um, yeah, that's, that's kind of my experience. Undergrad good, postgrad not so good, but yeah. I can see it's getting better. Yeah. And, and what would have made a difference for me is having a, a lot more um, career development in high school. So the, I can recall having pretty poor um, career counsellors when I was in high school and, and I had a, a, was very highly motivated to finish Year 12 but there just wasn't sort of any um, lead up into thinking about a career and, and heading towards university. And I, I, I must admit that I, I, I did actually go to university when I had finished Year 12 and I was only 17 or 18. I lasted nine months. I signed up for a, a, a degree in psychology and uh, majored in philosophy. <laughs> And, and I just didn't fit in. I couldn't see where I couldn't see myself or my family maybe reflected in the university setting. But if I think I could have had a, a much better transition if people started talking to me and taking me to university when I was in year ten, and and got me thinking a little bit more forward, but also got me familiar with the setting because university was very scary. I can remember being quite a fragile seventeen-year-old girl and and going, yes, I'm going to be a psychologist. The first nine months of psychology, they set it up um, <laughs> doing statistics, I think, to actually breed out people. And I sat in the classes and I just thought, this doesn't, this doesn't, I can't see how this is going to be helping me help my community. But if I had a lead up to understanding what was actually going to be happening, I think I, I could have possibly succeeded, but I, I deferred it nine months and never went back. Yeah, just, just one extra thing on that, and I think this is something that's coming out of all the talks, is this whole power of cohort. If you're on your lonesome, it's yeah. horrible, but if there's a small mob around you, um, and this is one of the things that we've found so successfully works, is that there's a mob around, they'll haul each other through. You know, they'll yeah. all help each other, and you know, and it's not at the detriment of anyone's marks. They, they, they do better as a, a you know, team again, you know, but that whole thing of cohort, like it's a little mini community, it's such a big deal. Yeah. Are there any other questions? I don't know if the guests would like to comment, but I spend a lot of my time educating our families, particularly the Green University. No one's doing so I'm sorry to me. They're not going to let understand the process. So even though kids have got the ability to get to university, they can't be supported by their families and sisters and kids if they just don't have a good one And we always say that if you get involved, you can't wait there anyway because you know the process and you can just get involved with the security and the activities and the ground. The question is, um, we spend a lot of time, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, too, we spend a lot of time um, um, uh, translating or teaching um, our families. Uh, I hate to that teaching word because I see a one-way thing, but um, talking up to our families about the importance of, um, I guess, education and um, translating, you know, making research a good and safe space for us because uh, the challenge for us is because research has got such a negative, um, um, uh, it, it's, it's been a negative word um, in our families. How, how do you kind of balance um, working in that space to bring our people with us? Is that have I? Yeah. Oh, let me just give. Let me just give. Um, I was just saying, I spend a lot of time working with families to get them to understand the university system because even though our kids can get there, you know, they've got the ability to get there and they're actually shining, because there's that lack of support in the, in the family understanding what they need to tell them and support them to get there, then they just fall off the edge. Yeah. They don't actually make it to university. Just wondering if anyone, I think we need a better process to educate our families about university given that they don't get they don't get to university. It's not the norm for our to go to university. That's a great question. 
think one of the issues with that is that we've spent a lot of time and effort, I think, across Australia in many, many institutions doing, you know, familiarisation programs. You know, at my university we actually have a series of programs. We have one set called the Winter Schools and they're for kids in year 9, 10, 11 and 12 to come from all over Australia and, and do a sample week of what it's like to live in uni and then we put them through pre-programs before they start their degrees. And the idea is, is they go home then and start the, the discussions at the dinner table, you know, at uni I did this and this is where you can live and this is, you know, how, you know, so the, the periods or, you know, the, the timetable is all different. And, you know, people can get a bit of an understanding of it. But you're right, you know, the biggest issue that we do have is that the families recognise their kids are going to go to a different place, not just physically, but in their heart and their souls and their options. And in my family at the moment, my sister is going through a great deal of trouble because her daughter is, is enrolling in nursing next year. And she doesn't want to do new, nursing at Newcastle, which is home. She wants to do nursing at, in Melbourne, right, which is a city a long way away. My sister's never even been to Melbourne, right? So that is taking her daughter into a very different place. And there is no program that we have. We've spent a lot of time and effort getting programs to recruit kids direct from school. We're not so flash at with the so-called mature age people who have already been in the workforce. And we're certainly not flash uh, at it uh, yet about how we uh, support communities and families in, in coming onto campus and, and getting a hands-on feel of what this place looks like, especially if they're not living in the area where the, the university is. I think it's a really important um, point of honour. Um, and it'd be a great thing to have, uh, particularly in my own family. I think it would have made things a lot easier and it would make things a lot easier even today. Um, I still don't even really talk about university with some of, some of my family members. But the interesting thing is the older generation, like my grandmother, she loves talking about university and what I do and, and what um, some of my other family members, the few that have been to university, she's very, very proud and very supportive. Um, so I don't, I don't know what happened um, between then and you know my parents' generation. So, something happened. Um, you know, it was probably that time when all those horrible things around how research was being conducted, how that occurred. Um, but yeah, there were definitely, and I. I haven't really heard of anything that uh, brings in the family. So I, I definitely experienced that when I was in high school. There was uh, Charles Sturt University, which is where I ended up going. They uh, were doing like this massive recruitment drive and they were only interested in Aboriginal students and they showed up at this little school that I went to and somehow I got plucked out of a classroom with three other students and they said these are all the courses you could possibly do at our university, we'd love to see you there. And I thought, okay then. Um, you know, so um, that's how that all happened, but um, they, did, they didn't talk to my parents or my other family members. You know, I was in year 11 at the time, I think, and um, yeah, I think it would have really helped, particularly like my father and my mother, yeah, to understand, even if they had have come for a period of time to a university campus, like Lisa was saying, experience what that was like, because it, it is a different world. Yeah. Well, one of the things that we're looking at for, I was going to say, Vaughan, I can't see you there, but we spoke to, I spoke to Bell about just before we, um, before I came away, that um, we're looking at an orientation um, day for families, because we bring Indigenous students on campus as part of the orientation, specifically for Indigenous students, but we recognise, yes, Got to involve the families, absolutely, absolutely. We need to do more of that. And I'm, I'm getting the. the... Um, yeah, that, that's really important to um, involve the family in all of this because when you think of it from um, you know a family or a community perspective, um, letting letting your child go away um, to a university or particularly to another city, it's it's quite. Scary, and if they um, aren't involved in, you know, where, where their child's going or have an understanding of that, then of course they're going to be hesitant, and of course they're going to be fearful and afraid. Um, so it's just so important to when we 
do programs or in whatever um, spaces we work that we actually um, talk about the, the family and involving uh, every, every member. Um, so I would just like to um, thank you for coming, particularly my strong and deadly guests here, and I'd like you to put your hands together for... Thank you.